are dominating the SANFL and have proven themselves more than capable on the big state of origin stage. Two of them will go on to stellar Hall of Fame careers and be recognised as all-time greats, while the other is, at this point, universally considered to be the most exciting prospect of the three. But his football story will have an altogether different ending. The Peter Motley story. Welcome to Headliners. It's made me more determined than ever to play next year. Carmen, you're in. There's Hudson in the hand. Peter Mark Motley was born in Semaphore, Adelaide on September 24, 1964. The second of three children, Peter is born of fine athletic stock. Peter's mother Gaynor represents Australia in both netball and basketball and played state softball. While his father, Jeff, is a South Australian football legend, winning the 1964 McGarry medal and playing in nine premierships with Port Adelaide before embarking on a coaching career with Port and North Adelaide. He is an icon, uh, Jeff, of, of South Australian football. They're a remarkable family, they're a very highly respected family and I have a great respect and admiration for the Motley family. Jeff w was a complete athlete, very talented, very courageous footballer, won the McGarry medal. Um, so he was a talent. Peter is an offshoot, it's in the genes. Peter has grown up living, loving and breathing all things sport, particularly Australian rules football. An outstanding natural talent from the first time he laces a boot, Motley represents South Australia at both primary and secondary school levels. A fanatical Port Adelaide supporter, the Magpies have the option of selecting him via his family connection, but they never extend the invitation. Peter following his schoolmates to Sturt instead, where he quickly progresses the ranks to join the senior side at 17 and never looks back. Despite the enormous pressure of being the son of a legend, Peter Motley does not disappoint and a new South Australian footballing star is born. Well, he was always a year younger. Uh, Brattles and I and, and blokes like Chris McDermott and, and Andrew Jarman. When we started playing league football, we knew Mots being a year younger, we sort of knew about this kid Motley. We knew how good he was in the juniors and um, we knew he was coming through. He played for Sturt, I played for Port, other side of the tracks. Um, they were the toffs, so to speak. We went, you know, we just sort of knocked around together a fair bit and uh, just became close that way, as you do. And, uh, you know, obviously we played against each other plenty of times. Well, I stood in one day. I don't think Mott's played sent our back too often. I was sent our forward for Glenelg and um, he, he was a ruck rover. He just played on ball and uh, he ran all over the ground. Mott's is you know, perfect, just perfect for on-ball footy. And uh, I just remember days where you know, the stats read when he played for Sturt, 30 kicks, uh, 10 handballs, 18 marks, that sort of thing. He's a ruck rover, bouncing around all day. He's a, he was a gun, gun footballer, good luck. Peter Motley was nearly going to be the best that left this state, I think. He was an absolute champion. Play anywhere, play any position on the ground. Smooth as silk, absolutely fearless, scrupulously fair, uh, a gifted player, absolute beauty. And what a great guy. I watched him all the way through, and I, I, I had him out right there with the best that this state produced. He did play either one or two state of origin matches for South Australia because at that time I was actually a state selector uh, and he certainly was not out of his depth. Peter Motley lines up on Geelong superstar Gary Ablett in the 1985 state game and proceeds to tear Victoria's hottest player apart. Motley hauls in 17 marks. Ablett shifted away from Peter, who collects the coveted Foss Williams medal as best of field for the South Australians. Basically, he was a bit like a Malcolm Blight, I thought. Um, you know, he, he was mobile and, um, you know, he had a terrific leap and, um, you know, he was a good kick as well. And, um, you know, he was a, a brilliant footballer. And, you know, he, at that time, uh, Adelaide had some terrific young players coming through the underage and uh, Peter was probably the best of them. I think of George Hurd, but Motts was more spectacular than George Hurd. I mean, he, he could do anything on the field. As I said, take hangers everywhere. He took Mark of the Day twice a week in Adelaide. He had South Australian footy by the balls, you'd say, and um, he was ready for Victoria. Tackles, does it well too. Whittlesey this time, but the handle's not strong enough. Dre is there. Whittlesey, Motley, Sturt get a go. And the Victorians are more than ready for Motley, who has become one of the hottest footballing properties in the country. The race is on to secure his prized signature, with the Sydney Swans appearing to be in the box seat. I went over to Adelaide uh, with a group of us, Barry Round and Mark Browning, Bernie Evans and myself, when uh, he'd signed a Form 4 with uh, the Sydney Swans. So, gone over to meet 
uh, Mots and uh, Jeff and the family and that, and um, you know, to convince them that you know going to the Swans was a the right thing to do. None of us wanted to leave South Australia, I can safely say that. We all wanted to play in South Australia. We love the competition, but at some stage you just had to try and test yourself. And we thought, well, you know, let's, why, not, um, why not join up and, and, and play for the same team? And, you know, we're good mates. It's just, uh, let's just enjoy it. It's going to be hard enough over there as it is. Peter and Craig were a, a double, and what a double it was. But uh, you had to convince both that they were going to the one club, and. Uh, there's a fair bit of work I had to put in there to get them. Ian Collins and his Carlton recruiting team move heaven and earth to secure Motley and Bradley. The Form 4s tying them to Sydney and Essendon respectively have expired, releasing them as free agents once more. The Blues pounce, also signing long-time target Stephen Kernahan and Western Australian John Dorotich in one of the greatest single recruiting halls in football history. Carlton coach David Parkin most excited about securing the signature of Motley. It was a six foot two, running half back, half forward, ruck rover type player who was brilliant in the air, but he had his long arms, etc., and this great flexibility in his play, but equally as happy on the ground. Motley could run like Bradley and had this aerial component, almost like Kernahan when you think of the three. He came across with um, Stephen Kernahan and Craig Bradley. Now, both all time greats, both of those two, but good judges said that Peter Motley was the equal of those two and would have uh, stood up uh, with whatever they did. He rang me every second or third week during the 1985 season. On a Sunday night I get a phone call from him and he would talk through his game and the role that he played and how could he improve this and what should he do about that. The only single player in my history as a coach who was talking about his development as a player prior to even arriving at the Carlton Footy Club. The greatest disappointment for me, when I think about it now, is that I've not had the um, opportunity to, to coach him in that, that initial period. Um, he, he was just a wonderful young man. Parkin is replaced as Carlton coach by Robert Walls at the end of the 1985 season, just as Kernahan, Bradley and Motley are preparing to leave home and head for Melbourne to try their luck in the big time. It's just something that I've got to do. Uh, I guess every player wants to play in the best competition and I'm no different. Yeah. Have you got a plan to stay there a certain number of years or do you feel that you might even finish your career there? Well, I don't know. I haven't got a plan at all. I guess that would depend on, on success. But before the fanatical Motley can board the plane to sink his teeth into his first gruelling VFL pre-season, he suffers an injury that will set him back for the bulk of season 1986. He was having a kick to kick with his mates and he buggered up his ankle, did all the ligaments and God knows what. So he, when we came over and started, he was not on a level playing field. He wasn't right to go. He couldn't do all the pre-season and that just sort of was killing him. Basically, he came across uh, in plaster and um, uh, was a long way behind everybody else. And people don't realise that, you know, he had to overcome that before he played his first game. He was training when he probably shouldn't have been training because he just wanted to get out there um, instead of just resting it a bit more. So that set him back at the start. Despite starting well behind the rest of the playing group, Peter Motley works himself into the ground to make up for lost time. He was always the first at training, always the last to leave. He'd train on the off nights. He just, at home, he'd stay with a ball in his hands all the time. He was supremely fit and, um, as I said, not an ounce of body fat on him. He'd, he'd be eating, uh, he'd walk around the house eating a raw potato. He does that. I mean, I don't mind, you know, watching the diet and things like that, but eating raw potatoes and things like that, I mean, but that was his way. Motley makes his long-awaited VFL debut in round two of 1986, despite missing most of the pre-season. Significantly underdone, he just hasn't been able to get the necessary miles in his legs to catch up. Probably his first half dozen games, he was um, on and off the ground a bit, and that's something that had never happened to him before. I think that was probably about the time that we settled him on the half-back flank, and from that point on, uh, he just started to blossom as a player. His um, determination, that's his biggest strength. You know, he's very, he was a pretty player to watch, you know, very elegant, had a massive leap on him, um, very rangy with his arms, and uh, just could take a spectacular mark, and that, I think that was the thing that people liked about Motz's game the most, was. Uh, 
you know, it's a bit like Gavin Wanganin can take these marks that somehow his body twists and turns and so courageous. That, you know, he had the work ethic, even though he was, uh, you know, had these high marks, he was still a running player and he, he was so dedicated and determined. Um, he just willed himself on games. A lot of those players that are elegant to watch don't will themselves through games. Well, he did that. Braddles is as good an athlete as I've ever seen and, um, you know, Mot Motts was you know, probably the equal, they're a different size, Motts was a bit bigger and um, they settled him off a halfback flank, I think he probably would have said, and um, he was just starting to go pretty well and uh, he, he was being groomed to go on board. Towards the end of the year and um, in the finals you could see playing off a halfback flank mainly, uh, he was starting to uh, really uh, develop. He was just a, a natural, you know, he's a natural runner, he's a natural mark, he's just like a jump jack in the box, he was jumping all over the place, he's a beautiful mark, good kick. Had everything, you know. He, uh, he was a physical fitness fanatic, and uh, probably a perfect play. Peter Perfect, I suppose, is the easiest way to put it. He was just uh, a magnificent um, athlete, and um, you know, he, he wore the gel and all that sort of stuff. And he, you know, he was worried about his looks all the time. But um, other than that, he was just a, a terrific athlete and a great clubman, and uh, you know, great to have around the place. Peter Perfect, as David Rees-Jones refers to him, continues to get better and better as his match fitness improves and he adjusts the additional pace and ferocity of the VFL. Motley polls Brownlow votes in two of the last four games of the season, providing invaluable aerial strength, run and creative flair off half-back for the Blues as they storm into the 1986 Grand Final, only to be stopped in their tracks by season campaigners Hawthorne. Carlton look ahead to 1987, determined to make amends for their failure. And no one is keener to prove their worth to the football world than Peter Motley, who, at 22 years of age, is longing for the chance to show Victorian fans just how much he's truly capable of. A season that Peter Motley will never forget. That's next on Headliners. He's just a bit of a Hollywood. He'd be pretty popular and uh, super fit. You know, he's really a footy nut and um, he had a great job. You know, it's just, he was almost, uh, he had the perfect world. Prior to his first pre-season, prevented him from showing Victorian fans his best throughout his debut season of 1986. With the Blues humiliated by Hawthorne on grand final day, the entire team enters the 1987 pre-season desperate to make amends. Fitness fanatics Motley and best mate Craig Bradley, as always, out the front of the training group. We're pretty dedicated and we have lofty ambitions at that stage. Um, both very, um, you know, goal oriented. So we're sort of pushing each other in some ways. You know, you live with your mate, you want to make sure that you're both doing well and you help each other. Of course, they have Brattles and um, Mott's come along who are non-drinkers, non-smokers, non-anything, except uh, wanting to uh, play football and look after themselves. It was probably a bit unique at that time. Everyone would be pretty stuffed and he'd make a point of jumping up and bouncing around at the front and you know I'm sure he's showing off I'm sure that uh, and that's part of being a sportsman you know like he's just wanted everyone to know hey I'm 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 still going here you know I'm I'm ready for more he sent him he was sending a message he, he will say he wasn't but I'm no he was why, why else would you be jumping up what touching leaves he just wanted us all to know look I've got more in the tank and uh, if we want to go around again I'm right going into his second season he, he was ready to uh to just show the footy world how good he was. I can remember we played practice matches that summer of, uh, of 87 and uh, there was a particular game we played at Meriburra in country Victoria and uh, we let him loose as a ruck rover, you know, his favourite position. And I reckon he, he had a point to prove. He said, OK, well, for 12 months you've sort of had me had the reins on me. Uh, now I'm just going to show you what I can do. He was just, look, as I said, he was ready to take it on. I remember that day at Meriburra, I sat on the bench, I had a, had a groin injury and... I sat in the bench for the first half and Mots was dominating all over the place. He took uh, two or three real speckies and uh, you know, it was just looked like uh, he was going to be anything. Certainly coming to the 87 year was showing some very powerful signs. He developed in, in confidence and understanding of what the game was suddenly to be and all about. And uh, Colo made some uh, statements to me that he felt uh, that Peter was going to be uh, quite exceptional and was heading in the right direction and uh, if anything a little bit ahead of, ahead of target at that point of time. And he was bigger and he was stronger and he'd had a year of uh, VFL behind him and he was just sensational and I just thought gee you know we really have got a player here and uh, and the start of 87 he was playing more in the midfield.
Carlton's star-studded lineup starts 1987 strongly, with four wins in the opening six rounds to be sitting one game behind the Swans in second position. Motley has moved into the midfield rotation and is blossoming under the added responsibility and opportunity. So as he climbs into his car to head home after Thursday night's training and team meeting, life could barely be better. Football has been his sole focus for as long as he can remember, and here he is rising quickly through the ranks of one of the greatest teams in the game. He can barely wait to get to Saturday's game against Geelong at Waverley. Maybe he'll even get another shot at Gary Ablett. But fate is about to deal him a blow far more brutal than anything the great Geelong superstar could ever muster. We had a routine where we would train Thursday night, then the senior players, we would have a team dinner at the club, and then after the team dinner, we would have the team meeting. And uh, that was just, you know, the normal for us. So we probably wound up, might have been around about eight o'clock, and uh, you'd then head home. I was quite close with Pete, just the fact that Pete was next to my locker, and, you know, obviously there was a lot more conversation than going down a locker 21 with Rattles was. We were just sitting in the change rooms. I remember vividly just sitting on the ground and just discussing, you know, certain things with other players, and, you know, we went to the team meeting. Once the team meeting was over and done with, we basically went on our merry way. I can remember the, um, that training night in the change rooms before we left for some reason, just all standing around and um, I guess it was strange because we normally drive home together, you know, we drive to and from training together and for some reason I think um, Pete's girlfriend at the time, uh, he, he, uh, he might have been going over, his, over her house after the training, that might have been why he took his car. I was uh, living in um, Eaglemont uh, with, uh, with Glazer. Uh, we were sharing a house and Motts was in another part of Ivanhoe with Brattles and uh, you know we were obviously he both heading in the same direction and both sort of came together in general traffic up to um, the intersection where Smith Street comes into Queensborough and we were stopped at the lights. Lights changed to green, um, Motts took off, I took off as well, probably two car lengths behind him. We probably progressed from that intersection about um, oh, I'm guessing 60 or so metres. We'd just passed the, the fenced area of the tram zone and all of a sudden just um, another car just seemed to appear out of nowhere from my right and just, you know, collided with, with, with an incredible impact into the driver's side of Motz's car. The thing I remember, it, it just, it obviously, the car had obviously actually hit the, the concrete um, strip and was actually you know, it just seemed like, to me at the time, it seemed like it had come out of the sky. It would actually hit Motz's car almost on a 45 degree angle to the ground. The force of that impact knocked Peter's car right out of view. And, I, you know, from memory, it probably knocked it a good 15 metres. It ended up on a, a grass verge facing the same direction. I just had a split second to realise, you know, shit, this, this car is coming at me now. And um, it was spinning at a, whether it had done a full 360 before it hit me, it just, horizontal spin pretty close to the ground and I just remember closing my eyes hanging on for dear life to the steering wheel and it just took the front of my car virtually stoved it in up almost up to the window and I, I closed my eyes for that instant you know when I when I opened my eyes I could see the Commodore I think just to my left it, it's it's it was written off as, as mine was and and Motz's car just just across behind it sitting on the grass um, you know obviously badly smashed from from, from um, in, 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 in Motz's driver's side. I'm, I'm hazy, I guess, on what happened after that. Um, and I, I, I guess I can put that some level of shock, but um, my recollection is getting out of the car, um, I, I, can, I can recollect I didn't want to go over. From what I'd seen, the impact was so severe, I didn't, I didn't think it was survival. I just thought that, that, that Motz would have, been, would have been dead. Unbeknownst to him at the time, Molly is, he's affectionately known through the football world, has already polled 12 votes to be the shock runaway leader of the 1987 Brownlow medal, with four consecutive best on grounds between rounds two and five. But suddenly football seems a million miles away as he staggers over to his teammate's mangled vehicle, bracing himself for the worst. By this time, um, people had come out from that. There were terraces sort of houses along the, um, you know, adjacent to the road at that point. Um, a guy that, um, basically said he was a doctor, basically had, had uh, opened the, came in and opened the pasteside door, I believe had got into the car and was actually um, 
assessing Peter. I, 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 I was there, I, my recollection is looking through the passenger side door, s certainly Moth was out, you know, eyes closed, obviously unconscious. Um, I'm not sure how long I, what, what I did, I, I, for whatever reason I have a memory of, of the doctor actually um, constructing a, a brace out of newspaper or something to, 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 to sort of stabilise his, his, his head. At some point I left that car having established that a doctor, you know, an ambulance had been rung and I went into one of the houses and actually rang the club. Peter Motley's chance of surviving long enough for the ambulance to even reach him is slim at best. The ferocious impact has split his skull from between his eyebrows to the top of his crown. A gaping wound some six centimetres wide that has to be physically held together to slow the massive blood loss until the paramedics arrive for the unconscious Peter to have any hope of survival. Paul Meldrum's personal recollection of those hectic minutes immediately after the collision is understandably clouded due to his surging adrenaline and the initial onset of mild shock. Those close to Peter have always been of the belief that Paul actually held Peter's skull together, thereby saving his life. However, Paul can't, to this day, actually recall performing this heroic act, but he can't categorically discount it either. I'm really hazy about what happened in the car, and, and I'm think, I may have, I've got vague recollections about maybe assisting the, the, the GP that, that came out from the house in stuff around the brace. I, I have no recollection, to be honest, about actually doing anything about the wound, you know, I guess the, the wound. Paul has never spoken about the accident until now. Not with the Motleys, not with anyone else at the club, and certainly never publicly. But his courage in coming forward to speak with us has immediately introduced a previously unknown element to this story. The Good Samaritan. The doctor who emerged from the terrace houses to assist in Peter's time of need. Up until now, Peter's family and friends have been completely unaware of the presence of any third person assisting in the vehicle. This mystery doctor, who according to Paul's humble personal account, took control of the situation and assisted Meldrum in keeping his friend alive. Meanwhile, Peter Motley's closest mate and fellow Carlton star, Craig Bradley, is stuck some 20 cars back in the traffic jam immediately created by the accident, totally oblivious to the dramas unfolding in front of him. You know, I would have been, you know, 100 metres or so behind him. But I didn't realise that, uh, you know, some of the, a couple of the guys had jumped out of their cars, pedestrians, and were just waving their arms as if to say there's been an accident up here and, you know, don't even try and come through here. And because of the slope of the road and everything, I couldn't see who was up there. But there was a side street to my, to my right. And I, I just quick, quickly zipped around and actually thought to myself, geez, I was lucky to, well, could have been stuck in this traffic for a while here, you know. I'd, had no idea what was going on until I got home and, I, and, and our unit, the, I knew Motts was ahead of me and the door went up for our garage and uh, his car wasn't in the, car, in, the, in the garage and I thought to myself, just for a split second I thought, that's strange, you know, you know but straight away I dismissed it because I thought, oh, he's gone over, he's gone over Andy's house, his girlfriend at the time. Got a phone call about probably 40 minutes later. It was a barman at Carlton. And he just said, look, Paul Meldrum's rung here, saying something about Peter's been in an accident. Um, and I knew straight away, well, I, I just knew straight away that that, was, that must have been it. Peter Motley lies within a grotesque disfiguration of mangled metal as the deafening explosion echoes off into an eerie silence over Clifton Hill. It will take a minor miracle for this brilliant young man with the perfect life and the football world at his feet to even survive long enough for the ambulances to make it to him. Peter Motley's fight for life. That's when we return next time on Headliners. But I remember saying to Pete, you know, his heart was just thumping. I'd never seen a heartbeat so fast, you know, just almost coming out of his chest, which was, you wouldn't have thought the body could actually do that, you know, but anyway, I'm, I remember saying, you know, Mott's, you know, there's people going everywhere. And, so Mott's just brattles, you know, like, I'm here, mate, I'm here. and uh, the. the the, uh, the ambulance guy just said, uh, look, I no, just don't worry about it. Training. Motley's teammate, Paul Meldrum, was piloting the car behind Peter's. The offending vehicle also destroying Paul's car before coming to a stop in the middle of the road. As Meldrum clambers out of his vehicle, the harrowing gravity of the situation hits him hard. Motley's car has been totally caved in on the driver's side. In Meldrum's own words, it just doesn't look survivable. 
Five minutes ago, life could barely have been better for Peter Motley. Now he's barely alive at all. The remarkable conclusion to the Peter Motley story. Welcome to Headliners. It's made me more determined than ever to play this game. Twenty-two-year-old Peter Motley has the football world at his feet. A brilliantly gifted high-marking utility, he is starting to blossom for Carlton in the early stages of 1987 after suffering an injury-interrupted debut the previous season. But the injured ankle that hampered his first pre-season pales into insignificance when compared to the horrific internal and external damage he's just suffered in this devastating collision. Teammate and best friend Craig Bradley has been notified of the accident and races straight... He couldn't get it out. And there was a doctor with him who, uh, I can't recall his name, who then said that he's in a serious accident, he's in intensive care. The phone rang, it was Stephen Goff, football manager at the time at Carlton, and uh, he told me that he'd heard that there'd been an accident involving Peter. And I just thought, gee, I you know, hope he's OK and, you know, didn't think too much more of it and then he rang me about 10 minutes later he said look it, it appears as if he might have a broken leg and, and I thought oh gee what a, what a disappointment for Peter and for us he rang about half an hour later and he told me it was a matter of life and death and, and you just absolute shock you forget football football doesn't matter he's a young man fighting for his life and what a fight it will be Peter has suffered massive head trauma and internal injuries. Doctors amazed at his fighting spirit and physical strength as he defies overwhelming odds to make it through that first night and into Friday. His parents fly in from Adelaide first thing the next morning as the football world awakes to the stunning news that one of its most popular up and coming young stars isn't expected to survive through the weekend. Oh, I found out the next morning actually I woke up and my mum actually had mentioned that she'd heard on radio and I think it may have been in the, uh, the paper that morning, I'm not too sure, but said that, uh, you know, that Peter had been in a car accident. It just seems so sort of surreal almost. That you, how could this elite athlete and this bloke who was just actually starting to build his reputation in Melbourne suddenly be critically injured? He was so badly hurt and the car so badly damaged himself and, you know, the first call was he'd be lucky to see it through. So that's, you know, made it... You know, I don't know if, it, don't know if anyone slept for the next week. It was pretty tough, and to get out and play on the weekend was even tougher. The Blues have a game against Geelong at Waverley the very next day. They arrive at the ground with their much-loved teammate Peter Motley in a condition so critical that it's quite conceivable that he may well pass away while the game is actually in progress. I just remember the rooms were so quiet before the game. There's no rah rah. We, we were in shock. We had a mate, you know, close to death at that stage. Was more likely not to survive. There was just an air, a whole sort of, I guess the atmosphere was just of, you know, the club was totally stunned. Um, it, it, all, you know, Motts was obviously in a coma at this point and so it was really just everyone, not a lot being said, but just, I guess everyone was just hoping that he was going to make it through. When we're out on the ground, I think Wayne Johnson, and just before we um, went to our positions, he called for a minute silence, you know, and the whole side just sort of stood in a circle and bowed, it, bowed its head. And that cracked me up. That was pretty hard because I was sort of, you know, in a different mode. We all came together and we said, let's do it for Peter. And John O was really emotional, I know that. And uh, I was really quiet. You know, I just couldn't uh, comprehend what was going on. No, we weren't going to lose that game. No way. Despite the agonising trauma of the previous 48 hours, Craig Bradley stars in Carlton's remarkable 56-point win over the fourth-placed Cats. Brattles was in, in a bit of turmoil, as you know, as a best mate and uh, all our best friends, but Brattles and him had a special uh, friendship and uh, lived together and, you know, I was in the hospital for the next three weeks. It was there day and night, you know, I think the only time one there was training and getting asleep. We've never ever known who was responsible in the other car for it, but there was no point we considered in doing any of this because you can't change what occurred. The priority was helping Peter, not trying to uh, seek any other redress. The Motley family are tight, tough and fiercely loyal. They simply refuse to accept the pessimistic predictions regarding Peter's chances of pulling through and set about a coordinated bedside vigil. I know what we were told, but we had one alternative to give in to what we were told or work on what we could uh, possibly do. We were pretty helpless, but having said that, we did all, all that we, we could and talking to Peter was a key criteria. And I used to uh, go there and sit with him and. Uh, talk with him and say I'm here for and uh, 
uh, you're looking strong, we're going to find a way. Pete's unconscious, what do you do? You know, you want to talk to him and they, they say that, you know, it's great to just just have, have your conversations and and uh, because, you know, you never know, they, they might be out of here. Peter loved his Phantom comics. He was a member of the Phantom Club or something. I think he still is. Part of all the process, we just used to read Phantom comics. Despite this physically and emotionally taxing ritual, Craig Bradley will go on to poll Brownlow votes in four of the next six games. A champion inspired by the courage and fight of his best mate, who lies in a coma, hovering between life and death. He would open his eyes, but everything wouldn't register, as we understood it. Uh, he was not only not able to speak, uh, he was partially deaf on one side, partially blind on another side, uh, but we knew that he was out of, uh, back to consciousness then when he responded to a command. And that was uh, probably about 10 days thereabouts. So for that 10 days, was his life in the balance that entire time? Yes, very much so. And he, and he picked up uh, some other serious injuries as well because his chest and lung was uh, seriously uh, affected uh, by this and we had to overcome other difficulties besides his uh, brain damage side of the left hand side of his head. Those times in uh, ICU uh, were difficult times and I suppose the most difficult when they took him off life support and to, to see whether he would survive and uh, you know there was no guarantee that was going to happen. The most difficult thing about it was um, um, you know, as the weeks went on because his, his, his muscles started to waste you know and you could just see him wasting away and that, that was really difficult to see that you know one of your best mates is just lying there and, you know, he was just wasting away. You know, it was tough to see him like that, but also great to see him that he was alive. And uh, as I said, you know, you've got to remember when, when it first happened, those first few days, we were getting prepared. They weren't going to get through it all, so it was great to see him. And he was, he was alert, his eyes were open, and, you know, I think he was acknowledging that we were in the room. Peter Motley is growing stronger by the day. Out of his coma, he still has a long way to go, but with the remarkable support of his family, friends, teammates and medical staff, he will continue to defy the odds and live. After the break, we'll hear from Peter Motley himself as he fights to adapt to his new life. Second in car accident on May 7, 1987. Now out of his coma, he's surrounded by loved ones determined to nurse him back to health. He must learn to talk again and walk again. Life will never be the same. Every day its own individual battle for a man who seemingly had the perfect life. People can't possibly imagine what it's like. You wake up where uh, you can't speak, you don't know what's happened, you can't recall what's happened, and the entire right hand side of your body is not functioning. Um, I've always considered Peter as being one of the bravest people I've, I've ever known. For uh, to be able to cope with and still remain sane with that where you can't speak and can't understand why and you can't accept what's gone on to be so physically fit as he was and to lose in something like about 10 days, 22 kilos, and he had no weight to lose. That was uh, pretty hard, hard stuff. As I was, uh, had a downer and uh, Dad had always sort, sort of uh, sorted out and uh, get up on them and mm. get a, a focus. You've got to get back on the on the level. It's a total rearrangement of your life. Uh, yeah. What you were before, you're never <coughs> ever going to be again. My wife and I stayed at Peter's unit out at Heidelberg. There was a knock on the unit door. And there was this man, Bruce Stork, standing with a small little bouquet of flowers and just said to me, I just had to come, Mr. Motts. And uh, we spoke for two or three minutes only. He said, I've got to go now. And off he went. But he made the effort to come a long way just to be there. Such was the relationship between he and Peter, which uh, Peter still cherishes to this day. Peter throws himself into his rehabilitation with all the courage and determination that made him the fantastic footballer that he was. He recovers sufficiently to attend a game late in the 1987 season. All eyes on Peter Motley once again as he stars at Princess Park. As we went to go in and uh, sit down, the game had basically started. But the crowd uh, uh, noted that Peter had come in uh, and they had a huge sign that said, Get Will Motts. 
the grandstand crowd faced back at the grandstand to Peter and weren't watching the game that was in progress at that point of time. And he, he was bewildered that that would have happened. And they were just chanting, uh, uh, Peter Motley. Yeah, the roof went off. I mean, just cheering for, you know, a minute or two minutes or whatever. It was, we knew exactly what it was. It was just great. Everyone was there. Uh, it was an emotional time to see him up and away, you know, with the horrific injuries. Paul Meldrum's stellar run of form has abandoned him since the accident. Molly had polled four consecutive best of fields leading up to that fateful night. He will poll just one more for the entire season. Some put it down to the trauma he silently suffered. Meldrum dealing with the pain of that evening privately in an era when therapists and counselling were taboo words in the macho world of football. Certainly my form dropped away quite drastically pretty soon after that, but I've always put that down to just, just a coincidence, um, just, just a coincidence. Um, I was struggling, started to struggle with a groin um, strain and the rest I just put down to form. I think my form just, for whatever reason, fell away and you know, I spent a couple of weeks in reserve. I suppose at that time we didn't think there was any effect on Paul because he hadn't been involved in the accident but um, uh, you know, there's no doubt that that did take a, uh, a lot out of him because mentally I think uh, it uh, probably unsettled him for the rest of the year, but uh, we probably should have got him some counselling that time. Would you do it differently now? Um, yeah, looking back, I might have put <laughs> looking back, I might have put my hand up and just you know just been stepped through the events and um, yeah, I probably would have, would have put my hand up just just for I guess just from the counselling. The Blues are also wrestling with a separate tragedy within their ranks. Dual Premiership defender and popular club man Des English has been diagnosed with cancer. Carlton finished the 1987 season as minor premiers, then win straight through to a shot at grand final day redemption against the Hawks. Peter Motley and Des English, a constant source of inspiration. At a personal level, it, 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 it put the, the football into perspective. I guess th these were life battles going on outside with, 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 two, you know, with two teammates. It certainly galvanised the club, there's no doubt about that. It, um, you know, th th there was a job to be done on the field, but certainly that there was a driving motivation right through that season. There were three players that the team had committed to. Peter, uh, there was uh, Bernie Evans who'd been suspended in the, in the second semi-final and wasn't able to play in the grand final, got a one-week suspension. And uh, the other one was Des English. And uh, I can say this to you, in, I coached over 350 games. I reckon there might have been half a dozen times that I would have bet my house on the team winning. So it didn't happen very often. Going into that grand final, the resolve of the Carlton players was such, I knew we wouldn't lose. They were a big part of it, uh, Desi and, and Motts, and um, you know, I don't think you, you keep bringing it up every minute of the day, but it was certainly a focus, you know, especially come finals time. Not a word was said, but you didn't have to say a word. Uh, they were our three mates who couldn't be there and were doing it really hard and um, we were not going to let them down. It wouldn't have mattered what Rob said that day. It wouldn't have mattered at all where he put us, what positions. Um, no, nah, we're going to lose. Carlton finish all over the Hawks to claim the 1987 Premiership by 33 points. Thoughts immediately turning to the mates who couldn't be out there with them. Even in illness, Peter Motley has played his part in winning Carlton a Premiership. We knew where he was sitting in the crowd and uh, when the game was played and won, uh, the boys ran to the boundary and they knew where he was and they all pointed and, you know, held up the medallions and you're part of this. Uh, it was a lovely moment. Knights, Desi, Bernie, beautiful! It was pretty crowded down the rooms and Pete, Pete was there when we walked in, which was good. Everyone was giving him hugs and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was, couldn't have been happier, but in, in the same breath, he would, have, he would have been wishing he was out there. Everyone was standing around, Motts and Brattles with the photo, and it was just, it was a big moment. He, he was a huge part of that flag, and um, it was great that he was there for it, and, um, and I, I won't forget that photo. It was pretty emotional stuff. Gee, there's been some emotional moments on Grand Final Day, but uh, it's hard to forget the, uh, the acknowledgement, the public acknowledgement from Kernahan uh, and from Bradley in the rooms later. He should be out there, you know. Should be out there. I mean, it's not um, it's not really fair, but life deals these things up, and it's, it just rolls off the tongue when you say that, doesn't it? But when you know, for Pete's family and for Pete, and they 
cause of their own. I mean, it's, um, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? Whilst delighted to see his beloved Blues win the flag, Peter's absence from football is starting to take its toll on his mental state. Those close to him have allowed him to cling to his dream of one day returning to the field of battle. It has been the driving motivation behind his gruelling rehabilitation as he relentlessly pushes his body and mind. But by late 1988, some 18 months after the accident, the cruel reality that he will never play the game he lives for ever again is starting to hit Peter hard. Peter wanted to believe for a long time he was going to be able to recover to a level of being able to be involved in the game again. We allowed that to continue uh, and didn't discourage that because it was to help him positively uh, try and gain ground. The fact that I couldn't play uh, football anymore, that's about the worst uh, thing you could imagine. I was in a, in a, a downer for, uh, oh, for two, two months, I guess. Uh, not being playing football again, it's... Uh, became well, quite depressed. My life. Mm. His main love and his main goal since he was a kid was to, to play on the big stage footy and do well. Not just to play, but to do well. Now, he was right on the cusp of it. So to have that taken away in a heartbeat through no action of your own, I mean, I, I, I would imagine that would bring a pretty dark moment. Peter is also starting to battle mental demons that are causing panic attacks the further he strays from the comfort zone of his Glenelg apartment. Over the next decade, these attacks will become more and more debilitating. Peter extremely uncomfortable in all modes of transport. Remarkably, despite him having no recollection of the crash or the weeks after it, Peter's mind has pieced together the trauma. Just the simple act of driving through a local intersection will send Peter's anxiety levels to paralysing heights. His condition is initially considered to be a form of agoraphobia, the fear of being in open or public places. Peter is at risk of becoming a complete recluse before leading Adelaide psychiatrist Professor Sandy McFarlane begins treating it as a post-traumatic stress disorder in the late 1990s. He remains on medication for the ailment but has been able to once again take control of his life with the help of his remarkable family, particularly his late mother Gaynor and his ever-devoted father Jeff. He all of a sudden couldn't go anywhere, had to stay here for a while. Uh, in this area, this zone, and couldn't get out. And this was an extremely frustrating difficulty for him. But again, we worked through it. We found, we worked a program, put an uh, arrangement together, and uh, he won the battle again. He, he can now handle that. Jeff was there every second, every minute of the day for Peter. And, um, you know, it's been, he's given up a lot of his probably, you know, as a, you know, heavy into business and that, he's given up a lot of his life to help his son and uh, it's just a great story, father and son working through a, a, a major ordeal and uh, Jeff deserves a lot of credit as well as Pete for the work he had to do obviously himself and, um, and they're, great, they're great mates and uh, they've been through everything together. He, he moved heaven and earth to try to give Pete the best possible chance of recovery and uh, hours and hours and hours of his own time to to help the kid. Special bloke, Jeff Molly. Special bloke. And Pete's very fortunate to have him as dad. You make significant progress, it levels out, and then you have a downer again. And then you've got to find a way as to get it back up again and get the thoughts positive again. Uh, there was never a time where, when Peter wanted to give it away. He was just frustrated with the slowness uh, that it took to make any sort of progress. Pete had no, you know, didn't, didn't do anything wrong. Or he, was just, he was just there, a victim of circumstance. And um, I guess you do think about the coincidence of it all. But, you know, I, I will say that Pete doesn't entertain, well, he, if he does entertain it, he doesn't entertain it in front of me or others. You know, if anyone talks like that, then he doesn't want to know about that. He's more just getting on with the job. Yeah, that's the way he thinks, which is really great. I'm proud of the way he's handled it, particularly the way he's, uh, he's kept his, his, his same personality, his same natural, happy, happy self as such. Not easy to do that. To get through the way he did and to, you know, to work his body back to, to be where he is today and living a good life and uh, you know, running Adelaide, I reckon, is now, especially down at Glenelg. Uh, we're all proud of him and 
everyone loves Mots. It's almost a miracle to, to see what he's got back from because, um, you know, he, he was at, in a situation where, you know, the normal person out there, no way they would have pulled through. And for Pete to get back to what he is today is an unbelievable effort on Pete's behalf, but also his family. He would have become one of the great icons of Australian football, not only because of the way that he played, but the way he carried himself, the character and personality that he brought to the game was something special. And we were deprived as the football public and the Carlton Footy Club of this wonderful player. And to me, that's um, one in a lifetime. Of the 40 years I've been in football, it's probably one of the two or three real tragedies that the game has produced for me. We often talk about tragedies in sport and overuse the word because you know, we know what a real tragedy is, but I think in a sporting context, the loss of Peter, fo Peter Motley's football career was a genuine tragedy. Wilma Rudolph, the US sprinter who overcame crippling polio to become a triple Olympic gold medalist, once said that if you can pick up after a crushing defeat and go on to win again, you are going to be a champion someday. No matter which way you define it, Peter Motley is a champion. A champion footballer, a champion son, a champion mate, and maybe most of all, a champion man. And whilst he was cruelly robbed of the opportunity to fully display his talents on football's biggest stage, he has nonetheless proven himself capable of doing what champions do best, inspiring us mere mortals to do better and be better ourselves. Thanks for your company for this edition of Headliners. Join us again when we next head back in time to revisit another of football's biggest stories right here on Fox Footy. I love uh, uh, so I talk with uh, people and all of everyone. <laughs> uh, they know me around here just because uh, I s spoke and spoke to them and uh, uh, just enjoying life. Do you think Peter Motley's a lucky man? Yes, yes I am. I'm uh, lucky I wasn't dead. <laughs>